Welcome to a Mad Scientist production of Determining the Polarity of a Molecule, in which we will explore how bond polarity affects the polarity of a molecule, how to determine the direction of a molecule's polarity, how the shape of a molecule affects polarity, and how the elements on the outside of a molecule affect polarity. So what is polarity? First, molecules are neutral. The entire molecule has an equal amount of protons and electrons, with that in mind, if the negative charge, the electrons in a molecule, are evenly distributed around the molecule, then it is not polar. However, if the negative charge is not evenly distributed, then the molecule is polar. Water is a well-known polar molecule. Electrons are moving very fast, but the more electronegative oxygen pulls electrons away from the less electronegative hydrogen. In this color-coded illustration, we see the more red area has a greater concentration of electrons, so the oxygen side of water is more negative, while the blue has a lower concentration of electrons, so it is more positive. So a polar molecule has an uneven distribution of charge, making one side of the molecule more positive, denoted by a delta plus, the other side more negative, denoted by a delta minus. Water has an uneven distribution of electrons. It is a polar molecule. But why does this occur? We will take a closer look at water and a variety of other molecules to see what determines whether a molecule is polar, including its bond polarity, where there is an electronegativity difference greater than zero, and we will go through many examples of this, and also the outside atoms and its molecular shape including bent, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, pyramidal, and linear triatomic. We will go through several examples demonstrating these concepts and then put them in a flow chart. Let's take a close look at water and see why it is a polar molecule. First of all, it is bent, meaning it does not have a symmetrical shape. This is important and here we will define symmetrical as having all outside atoms evenly distributed around the central atom. The central atom here is oxygen, and both hydrogens are on one side of the oxygen, which makes it non-symmetrical. The hydrogens are not evenly distributed around the oxygen. Next, we look at bond polarity by the difference in bonded atoms' electronegativities. Electronegativity is a number that gives the relative attraction an atom has for bonding electrons. Higher electronegativities attract electrons more strongly than lower electronegativities. In general, electronegativity values increase across the periodic table from left to right and from bottom to top. We see here that hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1 and oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. The difference between 3.5 and 2.1 is fairly large, meaning the hydrogen-oxygen bond has a large polarity, which is shown with an arrow pointing toward the more electronegative atom, in this case oxygen. It is the electronegativity difference that gives the magnitude of the bond polarity, as shown by the length of the arrow. If we view the bond polarities as vectors and add them together, the resulting vector, or arrow, indicates the polarity of the molecule. The blue arrow is called a dipole, showing the uneven distribution of charge on a polar molecule. The arrow indicates the magnitude and direction of the polarity, pointing toward the negative side of the molecule. The symbol delta minus indicates the negative side, and delta plus indicates the positive side. Note these are partial charges, not the full charge that an ion would have. Let's look at a less familiar molecule, sulfur difluoride, with sulfur in the center. The Lewis structure shows two lone pairs on the sulfur, and so it is a bent and therefore non-symmetrical molecule. The electronegativity differences in the fluorine-sulfur bonds show a large bond polarity, but this time pointing toward the outside atoms, the more electronegative fluorines. Adding the bond polarity vectors, again, gives a large dipole with sulfur partially positive and the fluorines partially negative. Next, let's look at carbon dioxide, with carbon in the center. 
The Lewis structure shows each carbon-oxygen bond being a double bond. The shape of CO2 is linear triatomic, which is a symmetrical shape. The oxygens are evenly distributed around the carbon. There is a fairly large electronegativity difference in the carbon-oxygen bond. So will there be a dipole. What will happen when we add the bond polarity vectors? That's right. They add up to zero. They cancel each other out, so there is no dipole. Carbon dioxide is completely nonpolar. I hope you can see the importance of symmetry here. The symmetry is why the bond polarity is canceled. Now let's make the outside atoms different. How will that affect polarity? Here we see the electronegativity differences in the bonds, and thus the bond polarities are different. What will be the result of adding them together? That's right, they add up to a non-zero vector. SCO is a polar molecule with the oxygen side being more negative, the sulfur side being more positive. The symmetry in this case does not cancel the bond polarities since different outside atoms result in different electronegativity differences. Let's do a couple more examples and then put all this information together in a flowchart. Boron trifluoride with boron in the center has a trigonal planar shape which is symmetrical. The fluorines are equidistant from each other at 120 degrees. The electronegativities show a large difference in the boron-fluorine bond resulting in a large bond polarity in each bond. However, if we add up the bond polarity vectors, they add up to zero. The bond polarities cancel due to symmetry, and so there is no dipole. Boron trifluoride is a nonpolar molecule. Let's do something interesting. Let's replace one of the fluorines in BF3 with a chlorine BF2Cl. It is still trigonal planar, still a symmetrical shape but the electronegativity differences for each bond are no longer the same. The boring-chlorine electronegativity difference is only half that of the boring-fluorine bond. Adding the bond polarity vectors results in a non-zero vector, which is the dipole. BF2Cl is a polar molecule. Everything we have been looking at so far has been the result of combining bond polarities with the molecule shape and identity of the outside atoms to determine molecule polarity. Let's put that in a flowchart. You begin by looking to see if any bonds are polar, and if not, then you cannot have a polar molecule. For the purposes of determining molecular polarity, we consider an electronegativity difference greater than zero to be polar. Now if there are polar bonds, then you look at the symmetry of the outside atoms, which is determined by the shape of the molecule. Symmetrical shapes are trigonal planar, tetrahedral, and linear triatomic. Outside atoms are evenly distributed around the central atom. Non-symmetrical shapes are bent and pyramidal, and we include diatomic as a special case which we will get back to momentarily. Let's keep that list in the corner for reference. The rest of the flowchart summarizes the examples we have just looked at. If polar bonds are not symmetrically distributed, then the molecule is polar. If they are symmetrically distributed, then you have to look at the outside atoms. If they are the same, that means the bond polarities cancel and the molecule is not polar. But if the outside atoms are different, that means the electronegativity differences are giving different magnitudes of bond polarities and so they do not cancel. Let's take a quick look at diatomic molecules, our examples being HCl and Cl2. Because there is no central atom, the bond itself determines the molecule's polarity. For HCl, the bond is polar, and so the molecule is polar. For Cl2, there is no bond polarity, and so the molecule is not polar. Lastly, we will take a brief look at how changes in a tetrahedral molecule affects polarity. In methane, everything is symmetrical, bond polarities cancel, and it is nonpolar. But if we substitute a fluorine for one hydrogen, then both the magnitude and direction of that bond's polarity changes. The bond polarity vectors add up to a large dipole, CH3F, is polar. Changing another hydrogen to fluorine has the same effect on bond polarity. Again, creating a dipole, but with a slightly different direction. 
changing a third hydrogen to fluorine, we get the same effect. The polarity changes direction, but it is still polar. You should be able to explain why these three molecules are polar, as well as the direction of their dipoles. What will happen to the polarity if we change the fourth hydrogen to fluorine? Yes, you're right. Since all the outside atoms are the same, the symmetry results in bond polarity vectors adding to zero. They cancel each other, and carbon tetrafluoride is a nonpolar molecule. That's it. Another vid from a mad scientist. See ya.